All right. So this is uh, test better testing patterns of Apache Cassandra. Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm your host, Brian Hauser. Uh, as far as a quick intro, I'm a senior engineer for Amazon Key Spaces. Uh, I'm a relative newcomer to the Cassandra community. I've only been around a year. Uh, I've always been really interested in the art of testing. Uh, over the course of my career, I've been a test engineer. I've been a development engineer in test. Uh, I've been in the industry for different companies since 98. And I've seen a bunch of different changes happen, particularly with regard to testing. Uh, kind of going from manual testing to extreme programming, TDD, CI, CD. And it's really fascinating how far we've come. Uh, early in the industry, we'd hired tons of testers to verify regressions, ensure correctness. And all, all the while, uh, every test engineer I knew lived in mortal terror of that last minute problem that was caught too late. So I've seen cases where physical media had to be destroyed because of a last minute problem. And often the last minute problem was was caused by trying to make a bug fix too late in the process. I can tell you that an application like Cassandra 4.0 would have been impossible to ship with the confidence we have now. And a lot of that is thanks to modern methods. Uh, I'm, I'm still really fascinated by testing. I think no part of the development methodology has changed or improved so much. And the culture for it shifts from company to company, project to project. And uh, I really want to share some techniques of testing that I've run across both in Cassandra and other places, uh, things that we can really embrace and things that maybe we can use to improve. So here's uh, basically the agenda. Uh, first, I, I want to talk about testing so far in Cassandra, uh, best practices that have created our most reliable release to date. Uh, I really want to celebrate that fact, and I'd like to isolate some of the approaches that we used that made it successful, uh, not only so that we can use them in other projects, but also so that we can stay the course in our current one. I really want to talk about stuff that is on the horizon, uh, things that offer better performance, ensuring correctness under load, uh, protecting against regressions. Many of these tools aren't really a part of the project or the main build cycle yet. But I think that it's only a matter of time before they are. And I really want to talk about some of the latest techniques from the world of automated reasoning. This is essentially formal methods, but like a new variant of it that are lightweight and uh, more useful for testing in the small. And I think these offer the ability to not only improve testing, but also grant us a lot of like terrific flexibility in future initiatives. Uh, I'll try to take questions at the end. Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm uh, with, it's difficult for me to manage all of this stuff and see like, you know, keep track of the chat, stuff like that. So I'll primarily do this at the end. Um, we may not have time to answer too many questions, but you know, if you, if you want, you can always email me or, or contact me on Slack. So if we run out of time, that's that'll probably be the go-to. All right, so let's talk a little bit about testing so far. So a good place to begin when talking about it, testing is to talk about unit tests. And this is often the first thought we have when we're coding an application. And like for Cassandra 4.0 proper, we have about over 5,700 unit tests. But a real question is, what does that really mean? There isn't really a consensus on what is and isn't a unit. So Cassandra's overriding philosophy and the Cassandra community's overriding philosophy is that we really should be testing deeply with as many working parts as possible. And that means that for us, unit testing can run the gambit from a very conventional element that constitutes a unit, like a class or a function or a module, and it can go all the way up to everything that's on a single node, right? The code base generally doesn't favor using heavy mocking, but and it doesn't even balk at using the full file system if it, if it needs to. So one of the things that kind of comes up with this is there's sort of a new, newer popular definition of in-tag test. 
So intake test uh, used to mean in the minds of most people, again, there's not a clear consensus of terms, but for the minds of most, it meant like the end to end test, which is like you stand up a completely working system, you fire everything off, and then uh, you verify all of the pieces. And nowadays we, we've come to, we've come to this point where we're thinking of integ tests as being primarily what the word means, which is like subsystem testing. Testing, maybe not just a single class, but a collection of classes, a module, or uh, a big chunky component. Uh, we have some of the unit tests which fit the bill of the very, very traditional unit test, meaning they test only a class or small function. And then we have some tests that go all the way up to uh, effectively an embedded Cassandra. So there are lots of advantages with these kinds of approaches. I think the biggest advantage is that it offers greater confidence. Uh, it reduces some of the tedium of testing. And you really get a you really get a sense that this is going to um, refactoring isn't going to be a pain. So changing stuff isn't isn't a pain when you're testing in larger units. But there are disadvantages too. And one of the big ones is flaky tests. Uh, there's often slow tests, and it's it's hard to test or hit everything. So we'll be kind of talking about like some of the solutions that that uh, we might bring up to help that. Okay, so. Unit testing is one level of the onion. There's another level, which is what we call distributed testing. And distributed tests in general are pretty hard. And it's the crux of what we do. So the cap theorem locks us into eventual, eventual consistency. We have race conditions of plenty. It's hard to keep track of connectedness. Uh, so to help deal with that, we have tools like CCM and the newer Java distributed tests. And what these do essentially is create a virtual cluster. They allow us to like run lots of different, uh, several different nodes on a single machine. Uh, a clear takeaway from this, especially for other projects, is this is a really useful and, and attractive concept because it allows us to do all sorts of interactions uh, fairly without requiring a ton of setup. And they also allow us to have some options for parallelizing. We could even imagine in the future like more complicated or abstract things like abstracting the network layer between uh, the connection between the nodes so that we could simulate failures or network problems. But again, this is a still like focusing on a single machine. And then finally, the, the other kind of layer of the onion that we have right now in common application is performance testing. <clears throat> And a lot of the performance testing is not so much benchmarks, though that's important too. Uh, a lot of it is, do I have correctness in the face of stress, right? Uh, Jepson is a good example of this. This is, Jepson is a tool that actually can work with lots of other different systems and has been used in lots of other Apache projects like Aerospike, et cetera. And basically what Jepson does is it executes, it spins up a bunch of clients on a bunch of different threads. It controls a scheduler. And essentially, it, it uses that control to like sequence and, and send a bunch of different requests into the system and then verify or check against a bunch of invariants about how the system is doing. Uh, all of that is like, let's try to exercise the exercise uh, a cluster. Let's try to like throw a lot of stuff in there and see if anything breaks loose. Uh, we also have lots of different text, <clears throat> excuse me. We also have lots of different tools for load generation. So there's Cassandra stress, there's uh, TLP stress, which is something that we, uh, is a replace, kind of a replacement for Cassandra stress. It strives to be easier to understand and have richer documentation. Uh, there's also NoSQL work, uh, NoSQL bench, which people have probably talked about a lot. And this is, this is basically aims to replace YCSB and it's better suited for operators. Uh, I think the big takeaway from from this set of tools is that, you know, doing performance tests and doing stability tests is more um, is something that has a wider audience than just developers. So that's one of the reasons why all of these different iterations of tests are showing up. And then finally, we have micro bench tests, which are tests that test minute break benchmarks in an instrumented process. Okay, so that's enough about like the kinds of techniques that we use. And 
for the most part in um, our pipeline, we're really we're really focused on test the unit or the node in isolation, kind of test a test a virtual cluster. Uh, one of the things that's really kind of moving forward in in uh, our process is this notion of, well, I really want that correctness under load. I want to be able to throw this at a realistic, I want to throw realistic load at a cluster and be able to verify stuff. And this, of course, creates some difficulties in verification. A really common thing uh, to use as a way of verifying stuff is to use a technique called differential testing. And I'm going to, differential testing is probably not, not uh, terribly unfamiliar to anyone. Uh, a lot of times it's called comparison test. But I, I'm going to include a few terms because I think it's, it's really handy to know what some of these terms are, especially when you're looking or applying them to different, different testing tools and systems. Uh, one of the real common terms is SUT, which means the system under test. Basically, this is the thing that we're testing. Uh, there's often an oracle, which means it, it doesn't mean the, or, the DB provider. Uh, oracle really is the system that we want to compare, right? So differential testing as a, as a whole basically sets up a set, sets up an oracle, and then ferries traffic to both systems and then compares the state and responses of each to verify that they're, they're in sync. So Oracle is the one that we trust. SUT is the one that we're verifying against. And then another common test or a common term that shows up in this in this sort of explanation is the concept of fuzzing. And fuzzing is essentially generating random load, right? Or generating random uh, random requests in the, the manner in which you do that. So here's kind of a graphic representation of the two systems. We ha we'll have a test engine. Uh, the test engine sends traffic to the Oracle and it sends traffic to the SUT, and then it verifies across the two of them. So the good news is there's actually already a lot of work in this area for standing up just differential testing frameworks. And Cassandra 4.0 has full query logging. And full query log logging is a feature that really opens up a lot of possibility for this kind of testing in the future. It basically lets you replay or shadow traffic from one cluster to another. But here are the ones that uh, exist now and that are rapidly getting more development. So first we have uh, Gemini. Uh, Gemini is interesting because it was originally designed to be used for SciliaDB as part of their battery of compatibility tests, but there's nothing in Gemini that uh, restricts it to just SciliaDB. So this can be used to compare two instances. It can also be used to compare, um, it can also be used to compare two different versions of Cassandra. There's a newer one that's called the Delphi which tries to use the best of breed. So it uses NoSQL, NoSQL Workbench. It uses Gemini, Cassandra Diff, and it uh, creates, can create tests for an existing schema. And you can use this for verifying versions and whether it's okay to jump to a, a higher version of Cassandra. There's another tool that's really interesting, which is called Fallout. This isn't really doing differential testing per se. Fallout is like a general uh, web service testing platform that allows you to run a variety of things. So you essentially can have it provision uh, infrastructure, configure that infrastructure, and then execute tests in a pluginable type fashion and be able to check and verify all sorts of stuff. So uh, really has a lot of potential. And one of the more interesting approaches is Harry. So Harry means, is, means uh, to attack. Right, like to harry someone. And a lot of this, a lot of what this does is harry uh, essentially fuzzes load from a generating ID or from descriptors. Uh, and it uses that plus logical timestamps. And what it does is it essentially has this uh, fuzzing generation algorithm that is bidirectional. So the real advantage there is that it has the ability to essentially play traffic against a, a cluster and then compare it, essentially do a differential test, but do a differential test without keeping track of a lot of state, basically without standing up an, another instance in and of itself. So really interesting. I'm, I'm probably not going to do it justice here, uh, 
there's already uh, there was already a really good talk. Uh, it'll be available on YouTube uh, for for Harry that that goes through all the particulars of this. Okay, so we talked a little bit about that. Those are all things that we have a lot of hope for in the future. Let's talk about some methods that live in the far frontier. Uh, specifically, I want to talk about the use of automated reasoning to test things better in the small. Uh, another way of ta talking about this is to refer to it as lightweight formal methods. <laughs> okay, so let's let's talk about the basic problem. Uh, a basic problem that I think we're increasingly discovering is that we're moving towards dividing up the core aspects of a Cassandra node into alternate implementations. And there's lots of reasons we want to do this. Uh, one of the primary reasons is to give users flexibility and choice. Uh, if you look, you'll see in the CEPs, there's lots of different CEPs covering like, how can I make storage pluginable? How can I make the mem table pluginable? Uh, there's also interest in doing this, I believe, because we want to be able to scale out components separately. We don't want to have one size fit all for, for a node. We'd like to be able to potentially scale different aspects like the gossiper or something into different processes and be able to have our users have a lot more options and choice in that regard. Now, the problem with this is a basic dilemma, which is how do you ensure compatibility? Uh, each alternative that exists adds to the configuration complexity of the system. Pretty soon, it's just this big combinatorial explosion. OK, so one idea for verifying compatibility is something that um, S3 and other places in uh, AWS have, have really experimented with. And it's this notion called a reference model. And essentially, a reference model is an executable specification. So you can think of it as like almost an alternate implementation, just in a much, much simpler context. Now, that may sound complex. It sounds like we're implementing the something twice. Uh, but it can actually be much simpler and easier to write because there's a whole collection of stuff that we don't care about. So we can make this an in-memory version. We don't really have to worry about durability, persistence, or how things distribute. All right. So one of the other things that this frees us up to do is we could we can potentially write a reference model in a whole other language that supports formal methods natively. Like we could write a model in, say, Daphne that allows us uh, deep model checking like preconditions and postconditions and verifying synchronization primitives. Uh, while this sounds really good, uh, I'm going to assume in this for the rest of this that we're going to write it in the same language. And that's because I think there's a lot of demonstration that that's really handy for some of the reasons I'm about to state. Now, you give up something by having it in the same language. Um, essentially, this, this is kind of the idea that we're, we're really thinking about here. So you have a formal specification. And typically, you do a formal specification. You do heavyweight verification. You do all sorts of model checking, et cetera, that operate against the implementation. But here, we're not going to do that. We write a much simpler model. We shrink everything down to a very simple reference model. We do whatever verification we can against the reference model. And then we do conformance checking. And what that really means is differential tests. We essentially run, just like we have been talking about before, we send traffic to both the model and the implementation, and then we verify stuff. This has a really nice effect, which is it formalizes our protocols and it formalizes the contracts. And if we add this to the build system, it overcomes one of the real classic problems of having a specification which is what happens when it gets out of date, right? If it's part of the build cycle, it's not going to get out of date. Anytime somebody wants to change something, it has to be changed intentionally. Now, there's some other advantages with having a ref model, and that is that it's a lot easier to justify changing or adding stuff to it. And here's one uh, particularly interesting example. So. Here's a pluginable mem table, which I sort of cobbled together from CEP. And you can see that I've added private APIs. And normally, like private APIs would be something that you'd have in another interface and everything would just support. But these go by a really weird name. Like we have crash and rebuild from commit log, et cetera, et cetera. 
These are things that no uh, client of the interface would necessarily call. So what this lets us do is, is the following. We can, we can essentially enumerate randomly uh, elements of the interface or the collective interface. We can put together uh, random or fuzzed input, and we can play them against both the reference model and the implementation. And then we can even use things like the crash operation and the rebuild from commit log operation to do stuff like simulate a crash, right? Simulate, you know, add fault tolerance to stuff or fault injection to things and verify the state and, and, and uh, behavior order. There's other advantages to having this kind of implementation too. Uh, one really great advantage is that ref models make fantastic mods. And having a, you know, one of the big problems with having a mock is that you're not really testing the back end. You're testing uh, the test creator's assumption about the back end. Well, in this case, the reference model is sort of the source of truth for how the application, uh, how that piece is supposed to work. It's a source of truth for that protocol. So that means that you can substitute it in. And it's also, it's also designed to be faster and smaller than the actual implementation. So this helps segment testing, right? Uh, another thing is that you can test different versions. So you can shrink wrap the ref model and peg it to different versions and make sure that things are compatible. We can do this in part or in, or in whole. Uh, if you think about something, a tool like Harry, which has a, a model and verify, you know, basically speaks Cassandra and knows how the order of execution is supposed to work. This is a similar idea, right? It's just applied to a whole, a much bigger granularity. And finally, one of the great things about this is we can instrument it, meaning we can add code into it, not only to do some of the things that I've described before, but also so that we can do things like drive test generation. We can use this to make fuzzing more powerful. So it should be obvious, with all this talk of fuzzing and random tests, we're essentially generating tests. And one of the problems of any generation algorithm is it's it's very easy to generate an infinite number of different bowls of oatmeal. <laughs> but, uh, you know, different bowls of oatmeal with different flakes are not novel. If any person looks at them, they're basically the same. That's one of the problems with uh, random testing. It's easy to hit, not really hit all of the different use cases that you want to. So how can we address that? Well, uh, one way that we can do that is through something called concolic testing. Uh, I'm going to start out by talking about briefly symbolic execution, and then I'll build into that. So symbolic execution is basically where we're just evaluating a, a piece of code as a pure function, a pure mathematical function. And I'm sure that sounds abstract, but it's made much simpler in an example. So here we have kind of a pseudocoded function. It's a bit of a toy. And mainly, mainly we're concerned with whether we're going to hit this assert. In real world, we may care about something else. We may care about instrumenting some other position. We may care about like whether ret val can be assigned to be null, et cetera. But well, for the time being, we're just going to focus on the assert. And what we do is rather than evaluate the code, we start going line by line and we um, start breaking it down symbolically. So at the beginning, we have X and we have Y. And so we assign X sub zero and Y sub zero or X sub not Y sub not. And again, this is these are the input values. We're not worried about variables and we're not going to keep track of variables. We're going to make everything a function of these dependent inputs. And we come to the first conditional, which is if x is greater than 0. And here we have a fork. This is a branch, right? Uh, every conditional has a branch, and every conditional can be made to be a branch of essentially two statements. So we have one path which leads us to x sub naught is less than or equal to 0, and we have another path that leads us to x sub naught is greater than 0. We're going to focus on the left-handed path. OK, and then we come to the assert. Now here we, we know that we're going to, we know the value of y is y sub naught. And we know that the value of the accumulator in this example was 1 because we're taking the branch where the accumulator is just hard coded to 1. That means the ret value is y sub naught plus 1. So the assert is yet another condition. 
and now we're kind of evaluating whether it's going to go left or right. And if it goes left, we have an error. And we can do that the same way against everything, against all of the branches. And we get this piecewise mathematical function. OK. So really, generally, the question that we ask in, in symbolic execution is, can we ever get to the bad note? Well, we can, you know, all the ones that I've circled here in Luscious Red are ones that we don't want to hit. That's ones where the assert can break. And we use the term feasible to say, yes, it is theoretically possible to hit that part. Uh, we use infeasible to say that it isn't. So typically what happens is we find one of these branches that is not good and we walk up the tree and we take each one of these conditions as a, a constraint. And we, we go to a solver called an SMT solver or a SAT solver. And we tell the SAT solver, can you find me an X sub naught and a Y sub naught where X sub naught is less than or equal to zero and Y sub naught plus one is less than zero. And the SMT will either tell us one of, well, three things really. It'll tell us, yes, I can, and here's an example. Sometimes it'll tell us that it's not possible to find an X and a Y that will match those constraints. And then sometimes it can just not return in a reasonable time frame. If it gives us an example, we know it's reachable and we know it's feasible. Okay, so that sounds really good, but um, in the real world, we often suffer from issues. So one problem is the tree can be too large. And the moment we have an infinite loop, uh, symbolic execution is a problem. We can't. We can't represent it naively anymore. It becomes an infinite tree. Uh, a lot of times, OS calls aren't instrumentable. Neither are service calls, right? We have no idea what those are going to return. And whatever is in instrumenting the symbolic analysis doesn't know either. So a lot of times, that almost looks like input in its own right. And as I just mentioned, the solver may not return in a reasonable amount of time. So that doesn't tell us that it's feasible. It doesn't tell us it's infeasible. It means we don't know. OK. So how can we overcome these problems? Well, with a combination of methods. But the main thing is looking at this tree and noticing it's just a tree. And we can traverse. We know how to traverse trees. right? We, we all learn this in computer science school. Uh, we can traverse a tree by just doing a traversal. So. One thought is we're going to execute this concretely, and we're also going to execute it symbolically at the same time. And then we're going to use that as a visit. And then we're going to uh, traverse the tree just like we would normally. So here, again, that's best shown with an example. So here we have, uh, here we have an example where we're going to plug in x equals 1 and y equals 1. Oh, I should have mentioned this. So we're going to give it a concrete we're going to give it a concrete execution, which is what x equals 1 and y equals 1 means. And we're also going to symbolically execute it at the same time. So because we're concretely doing it and symbolically doing it, we shove the two pieces together and got the word concolor. So we come back here, and we're going to plug in x equals 1, y equals 1. And now we keep track of the symbolic tree, but we just keep track of the path that we're going to. So here we have x sub naught, y sub naught. And we, and we know we're going to go off to the right because 1 is greater than 0. And so forth, we get, to, we get to the assert, which is the last condition in this case, and then we return. And now we have the ability to come up with the next iteration. So we can, we can go back to that previous thing where we have x plus, you know, when we have the system of constraints, x sub naught is greater than zero, y sub naught plus x sub naught is greater than or equal to zero. And we can take that constraint, we can negate the last one. And when we negate the last one and plug it into an SMT solver, we get a new example. But this example is guaranteed to investigate a different part of code than the one that we had before. And the only thing that we needed in order to start iterating on it was just one example. OK, so that's really cool. But that that lets us explore a lot of the the, the code. But it essentially, it's like 
turning coverage on its head. We're, we're testing all the parts of the code that we haven't covered. But there's, you know, like, how do we verify that it's doing the right thing once we visit it? Well, that's where combining it with re a reference model can really help, right? We essentially use, um, we essentially generate tests with concolic execution, and then we use the reference model to figure out whether the test is, to figure out what the expected state and response should be. What's more, we can even instrument the reference model to help us with this symbolic execution. We can actually put code that says, log this to some special file that will pick up, the test engine will pick up and evaluate at the end, right? So that's pretty useful. And then what we can do is use the symbolic execution to generate tests. We use the reference model to generate responses and guarantees or properties that we want to check. And then we just play them against the sub. So to wrap things up, here's a couple of takeaways. Uh, Cassandra has testing at lots of different levels. Uh, it tries to work with as much code as possible. There are lots of frameworks for, for testing with load and lots of different kinds of stress tools and cor uh, correctness tools. And these are all sort of oriented at the cluster level. And I think a big takeaway here again is whenever we're, we're creating stress tools, we wanna to think that there's multiple audiences for that tool, not just developers, but also uh, operators. We learned a little bit about reference models and how they can help us establish things like uh, API conformity. And we learned a little bit about concolic testing, particularly for better test generation. So there's a few uh, tools and papers. I don't want to overwhelm anyone. Uh, I'm going to make this available after the talk. Uh, but here's a, a few interesting places to start. So uh, Amazon S3 has used some of the methods that I mentioned here. And in uh, there's an ACM symposium on operating systems principles, which is uh, has an accepted paper by them, and they're gonna they're actually going to uh, have this symposium at the end of October. So that'll kind of talk about in depth uh, how this was used for S3 and for teasing apart the different bits of S3. Uh, another thing I'd like to mention is a tool or a framework called Java Pathfinder. And what this is is it's a uh, framework that allows you to do all sorts of symbolic analysis of Java code. It's also the basis for other concolic frameworks. So there's, for example, there's one called JDART, which uses this. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff just in this central node, though. So it makes a great place to, to start exploring or looking at these things. And then finally, there's uh, a paper that talks a lot about this called Directed Automated Random Testing or DART, and there's this paper here. So hopefully something that I have said uh, caught your interest. Uh, if you want to, please send me a ping at on Slack or on email uh, at Brian, bhouse99. Uh, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, I'll, like I said, I'll be trying to make the resources available after this. So like I said, hopefully, hopefully that has caught your interest. Okay, so at this point, I just would like to open up uh, the discussion for any questions that anyone had. Hopefully I'm on the right plot, spot. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. I don't really see too many questions. Uh, thanks. Thanks everybody for your support.
Would it be fair to summarize it as a combination of path coverage with model for correctness? Yeah, I think that would be uh, an accurate statement. I think that, like I said, like uh, hopefully you got this sense from the talk. It's we're we're combining we're combining all these techniques that have worked in the past. So we're combining like the differential testing that is really effective in large, and then we're kind of pushing it towards like units. Um, the reference model stuff can be really useful just by itself. Like one of the things that is could potentially be improved in Cassandra is there's a lot of use of singletons, right? Like so, something like this allows you to segment those things and and isolate them, which can be really handy. And then like all of these, each preceding layer sort of builds on the others. Okay, uh, if there are no more questions, I think we're at time. So great, we landed the ship on the, or we landed the, the plane on the, on the carrier. <laughs> All right, thanks everybody.